Well, we have a good group. I know some people are still coming in, but I want to go ahead and get started. Uh, we're really excited for this event uh, just to go over equity. What does it mean? How do you get it? What do you do with it? Uh, we're excited to have Blaine here, who is with Real Value Group, to kind of walk us through from an appraiser side and let us know what's the best way to get equity? What's the quickest way to do that? Things like that. And then I'm here from Treadstone to help you guys know how to use your equity and different methods that you can take for that. So if you have any questions, go ahead and send them to the chat and we will answer as many as we can. And I wanna go ahead and get started. And my the first question for Blaine is how quickly does my home appreciate after I buy it? Yeah, you would come right out of the gate with a tough one, wouldn't you, Brittany? Yeah. But it's a great <laughs> question. Uh, equity is on the mind of everybody, by the way, again, welcome everybody. Great to see everybody. Yes, no, almost everybody in here, which is always good to see uh, names and faces that I know. And as she said, um, if you've been to any of my classes or talks before, you know that answers to the questions are more important to me than anything. So ask uh, ask away. There, there's no uh, bad questions. Um, equity, as you know, I mean, this is a, a fairly simple definition. Equity is the difference between what you owe and what you own, essentially. So the value of, uh, but value as defined by the market. And that's the important factor that everybody needs to walk away with is um, in any of my classes, I always have one slide that says, you know, what's the difference between cost and value and worth? Because we tend to use those three terms similarly or to mean the same things when in the case of real estate in the case specifically of appraisals, they mean different things. The cost is what somebody is willing to pay. Uh, value is what it is worth to different people in the transaction. So there is a worth for the seller, there is a worth for the buyer, and then there is a worth for the appraiser, which is an opinion, but that opinion is gonna be based on market value. So equity essentially is uh, what you, the difference between what you owe and what the market thinks that your uh, house is worth on any given day. So um, unfortunately, there is no easy answer to how quickly your equity can grow because there are several things that can affect your equity. Uh, internally, meaning in your own home, one of the things that can affect your equity is of course, you paying down your mortgage. You know, if you come in, you win the lottery and you decide to put $100,000 on your mortgage, well, you're gonna have instant equity because now you owe less on the house relative to the value that it has in the market. Uh, internally or within your own home, of course, you can improve the house. You can remodel the kitchen, remodel the bathroom, do some landscaping, add gutters. All of these things tend to add some value. Important point about this one though. Improvements to the home always have to be taken into consideration. Um, improvements relative to what else that particular neighborhood or that market of homes finds acceptable or finds valuable. So for example, <clears throat> if you just bought a 700 square foot bungalow in say Alger Heights, little house, two bedrooms, one bathrooms, it's your first house and it's a great house. And you decide to put a $50,000 kitchen in that house. It might be the greatest kitchen in the neighborhood and everybody who comes over agrees with it. You may find, however, that others buying similar homes in that neighborhood would never pay for that type of upgrade in the house. They'd like a nicer kitchen, but they would never pay dollar for dollar, $50,000 for a new kitchen in that level home. Now, house that's maybe 500,000 or uh, 750,000 where somebody might spend 50, 60, 70,000, maybe 100,000 on a kitchen remodel. Well, that might be completely normal for that price range and that neighborhood. So equity in your home can be affected by the things you do to it, the money you pay down on your loan, what the market is doing on any given day, and also potential improvements that you do relative to what is acceptable in that particular area and to buyers of similar homes. Does that make sense? Yes. So if I own my home and I know that I have 50 grand and I want to start some projects on it because I want to start getting things going, yep. what should I do? Should I reach out and get an appraisal done to get that kind of advice? Yeah, great question. I wouldn't necessarily say you need an appraisal uh, done right off the bat. I mean, I love when people spend money with us, but uh, we don't want to take money where, where, where it's not needed. Um, what I would do probably first is reach out. Everybody knows an agent. I would reach out to one of your local agents um, they're, they're tapped into the market much like we are. And although agents um, have different motives, um, they're, they're there to sell. 
um, they see the same comparable sales as we do. So I would, I would recommend first, because it's free typically, reach out to one of your agent friends uh, or relatives and say, hey, we're thinking about doing these things. Would you look at some potential comparable sales in the market and let me know which ones are going to add the most bang for the buck? And I know we'll get to that question at some point. Um, and, and which ones will give us the most use value? Um, and those are usually the two big questions that we answer for people. First, they ask, which ones should we do right off the bat? We just bought our house, like you said, and you have $50,000 to spend. What should I do? Well, the first thing I would say is if you just bought the house, we assume you intend to be in that house for a while. Five to seven years, I think, is the average. So if you intend to be in there for a while, I would make my decisions on improvements based more on your own particular use value what you want to get the most use out of over the next five to seven years, because you're going to be living with those improvements. So whether it's, <clears throat> excuse me, upgrading the kitchen or the bathroom or the floors or whatever is important to you, I would say do that because your cost is going to be spread out over the amount of years that you live there. And of course, your equ equity will grow, assuming normal market increases each year, your equity will grow over time. If you're looking to just sell your house in the next year, well, then return on your improvements is a little more important. Then what I would say, again, go back to your agent, friends, or family and say, hey, look in the market for me, pull some good comparable sales that have been improved recently, and tell me what the most valuable improvements are. Now, we can tell you what NAR, the National Association of Realtors, typically say, and standard survey of most people, they would say, well, kitchens and baths are probably the most important because why? Well, those are utility rooms. You're using your kitchen, you're using your bathroom, and those are the rooms that people tend to want to see. Um, so typically starting there first, but always improving relative to what is accepted in that market. Wonderful. It's good to know. I like how you set your use value and then how you talked about the kitchen, because that is what people care about. And it makes sense because that's what you're using the most. You bet. I like that. You bet. Yep. <laughs> okay. Let's see. A little bit more on that. What about like if I put a new roof on? Mm -hmm. Is that more for me? Is that going to help me later on? Great question. So what I would say, usually the question is, um, Blaine, or, or it, it will be a statement like, um, Blaine, they just put a $20,000 roof on this house. Why don't we see it re reflected in an increase in value in that okay. house? And here's the thing. Uh, everybody needs a roof, just like everybody needs windows. So it's not that the value, that there is no value in putting on a new roof. It's that when there are things that are expected in every home, like a furnace in every home and a roof and windows and doors, uh, the market will pay considerably less for those improvements than what they cost. Again, not dollar for dollar. So there, there is no uh, standard uh, adjustment chart that appraisers have, but just for, uh, uh, for, for the sake of discussion, if the roof costs you $20,000, the market might only pay you uh, 25 cents on the dollar for each one of those $20,000. Because again, they look at it and they go, well, the house needs a roof. So why should I have to pay for a brand new roof? So upkeep on those kinds of things is super important. Uh, relative to all the houses in the neighborhood that don't have new roofs, a house with a brand new roof probably will go for a little bit more because people will realize, oh, I don't have to touch that for 25 or 30 years now. Uh, but rarely will uh, utility items get a dollar for dollar return, if that makes sense. Definitely. Okay. It's like putting wheels on your car. You know, hey, there's new wheels on there. Yeah, well, all cars need wheels to run. So. <laughs> right. Okay. So in the current environment here in Grand Rapids, inventory is pretty tight. It's, mm -hmm. it's difficult out there. Um, do you want to touch on that? I know it's a question that a lot of people have, and they're kind of cautious about that. <laughs> yeah. Um, and unfortunately, it just is what it is. I mean, that's a horrible answer. I know it doesn't give much clarity, but uh, it's this way all over. I talk with uh, um, agents and lenders and appraisers around the country on almost a daily basis. And it is the same in almost every market. I mean, everybody is complaining about the same factors of extremely low inventory. Usually we say historically low. We've really never, at least in my lifetime or in this career, 20 plus years have never seen inventory this low. And then you add on to that 
uh, you know, inventory, very low inventory is not a big deal in and of itself. But when you add in strong buyer demand, you know, if there were very few buyers on the market, low inventory wouldn't be a big deal. But there's something like 18 or 20 buyers for every house that is for sale on the market today. That means you're having all these competitive offers. Well, that drives up uh, demand. So very strong demand, very low inventory. And then the trifecta, uh, the, the, the third corner of this triangle is interest rates being historically low. So that creates more demand of people saying, wow, look how much more house we can buy when our interest, you know, when the interest rate, the, you guys, the, the lenders can tell people, hey, if we qualify you at 5% interest, here's how much house you can get buy. If it drops to four, look how much more house you can buy. And if it drops to three, so people's minds are blown with how much their buying power, how strong their buying power is at the current interest rates. And then of course they head out and want to buy a house and then they see, oh my gosh, there's a line out the front door of people writing offers on this house today. So unfortunately it just is what it is. It is part of the market conditions. Um, appraisers take that all into consideration. There are some things we just can't overcome, which we'll talk about, um, but it is the current market situation. Supply and demand are, are way out of whack. Yeah, definitely. We keep telling our clients here at Treadstone to have your pre-approvals updated, be ready to go so that when you find that house, you can put that offer in that minute, yeah. that second. L lenders, of course, have been preaching this for as long as pre-approvals have been a thing. Uh, and the, the importance of that always waxes and wanes depending on the demand in the market. I mean, if it was a complete buyer's market, people would be like, yeah, whatever, pre-approval, I'm in control as the buyer, but they're not. It's a seller's market all the way to the park. So without a very strong pre-approval, uh, you're just not even in the running in this. Mm -hmm. And there's some other factors that are written into purchase agreements, which I'm sure we'll talk about escalation clauses and appraisal waivers that, mm -hmm. um, the, the requirements to be in the game, so to speak, have gone up considerably. Yeah. Uh, one of the questions that we have is how often should a client update their pre-approval? Um, I would say in today's market, I would probably update them every two to three months just to make sure that everything is on the same track, nothing's changed. Um, your credit is good for 120 days, but just to make sure that you're on the right path and your letter is up to date. Too, so. And Brittany, what else would you tell them? Don't go out and uh, buy a new car. <laughs> Don't buy a, a wedding ring. Don't max out your credit cards, right? Yeah. Uh, don't quit your job. Don't quit your job. Well, that's that. a big one. Yeah, that's a big one. Yeah. Yep. Um, but yeah, you hit a lot of them there. Just don't don't go do anything crazy. Right now, you're getting ready to do probably one of the biggest purchases of your life. So keep your eye on the prize before you go do any other things. Yeah, you might want to go furniture shopping and rack up a credit card. Oh, let's get the house cool. first and then we'll do it. <laughs> well, yeah. We're going to buy this house. Let's go get our, our furniture. I, I hear these horror stories from uh, great lenders all the time of, uh, you know, just before close and they just did all these things. And maybe talk about that too is, um, are there, do, do you guys do a, like a secondary uh, search just before close? Are they reevaluating? Is the client still employed and do they have funds and all those things? Yep. So we're going to verify that they have the funds to close um, right before they close. We're going to reach out to their employer uh, normally a day or two before they close to make sure that they're still actively there. Uh, that has changed. And then as far as credit and see if they've had any new debts, um, we actually get notified through our vendor if credit has been pulled on them and we will ask them, hey, it looks like uh, our band pulled your credit. Did you open new credit with them? Oh, no, I was just looking around. Okay, well then we need to prove that. So we do get notified up until they close. What's your What's your most memorable horror story uh, along these lines of somebody who was on the path and ready to close and then boom? Yeah, I had a customer who finally found a house. He was super excited. He was looking for probably nine months. Um, and then we're through the process. We're almost ready to close. And he went and bought a truck with a payment of about $800 a month. And it threw everything into just a whirlwind. How are we going to do this? How do we make it work? Um, and luckily, there was an option for us to go that, down that route, but it didn't have to be that way. If you just would have waited like two more weeks, mm -hmm. fine. <laughs> Nothing will affect your equity more than not having any equity. So right. <laughs> wait until yeah. you acquire the equity. Definitely. Yeah, or the asset rather. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, there's a couple questions here. Uh, let's see. From Michelle, she said, last year this time we were entering the worst year of our lives. A few homes set on the market and I got a great buy from my clients. However, I think they will sell for much more now. Is the appraiser going to look at that past sale as a good sale? And will they still, and they will still have to update to turn so quickly? Great question. Uh, so yes, appraise, the appraiser's job is to analyze and summarize. Those two words are super important. Our job is to analyze the market, analyze what is affecting the market, what is causing sales to do what they're doing, and to analyze each one of the sales. So as most people know, appraisals, at least on federally related mortgage transactions, are almost solely dependent on comparable sales not income uh, from the income property and not the cost approach on new construction. It's based on what else has sold in the market that is similar to that property. We call those comparable sales. So we, when we pull comparable sales, we pull them and we call them or label them or define them as comparable for a variety of reasons. Um, in the, in the, the case that Michelle just brought up, maybe that house is um, right next to the house I'm appraising. So it sold last year for X, right during the pandemic. Do we look at that? Sure we do. It's a comparable sale, but we also then look at what happened in the market in the meantime. So this usually brings up a question, can appraisers give an adjustment for time of sale? If a house is six months or nine months or 12 months old in the market, do we adjust for that? The answer is an easy yes. If the appraiser determines that the market is increasing, and I don't think in any markets I've been working in, the answer is no, it's not increasing. Uh, appraisers will look at what the average is, what the standard um, uh, increase has been over that period of time, six months, nine months, 12 months. We'll look at a couple other factors, how much over list price did the house originally sell for and some other factors. But in almost all cases, we'll give some type of adjustment, assuming that that house would sell for more today than what it sold for six months or a year ago. If that makes sense. Let's see, how does adding or updating rear decks or patios influence market value? Um, so before we go on, because this, um, and, and I don't wanna turn anybody off from asking questions, ask all of them. But I wanna prompt everybody, you're gonna hear a lot of the same answer from an appraiser. And it's not avoidance of the question. Just understand that this is the way appraisers think. Everything you could ask me about how something increases or affects the value is always relative to something else. That is the definition of an appraisal. It's called the principle of substitution. We're always looking at one thing, in this case, the subject property or the house we're appraising, and what is it relative to something else, the comparable sales. So never does an appraiser, <clears throat> excuse me, do an appraisal of a home in a vacuum where we don't pull any comparable sales and we just look at it and say it's worth X. We can't, we have to always compare it to something else. So decks, patios, porches, kitchens, baths, gutters, shrubbery is always relative to what else is acceptable on that street, in that development, in that neighborhood, at that price range. And essentially what the market of other similar buyers are looking for from homes like that. So the deck patio porch question always comes down to, and I'll always throw it back to people. If you're a member of my Facebook group, which I think most people um, here are, this question comes up all the time in a variety of forms. How much does X add to a house? How much will windows add? And we always throw it back and say, it's, it's all relative to what's going on in that neighborhood. Do buyers mm -hmm. expect a deck, a patio, or a porch on houses in that price range or houses in that neighborhood? If you look at all the houses in that neighborhood and there's very few decks, patios, and porches, it may add a little bit. Obviously it's a benefit, it's a feature usually, but it's a question of, well, what else can they get in the market and does everybody expect it? So let's flip the script. If the house that's selling doesn't have a deck, patio, or a porch and every other house in the neighborhood does, the only way that the, the new deck is gonna affect the sale price is potentially to bring it up to where all of the other homes are. You're making it more similar to what's expected in the market. Good answer. Definitely makes sense. All right, I'm gonna uh, shift gears a little bit here. So for an example, let's say that I own a house and through COVID I'm now outgrown this house and I want something bigger. I have some equity in my house. I am nervous about what else is out there. Am I gonna overpay? Should I be okay with overpaying? Things like that. So. 
there's a lot of emotions there. I just want to know your advice on how to manage those. Yeah. Um, get a therapist and a dog, <laughs> of course. Those are the easy answers. Uh, because the real estate market is very emotional. And um, as you know, I, I normally say this when I'm talking to agents in a classroom is your, your job as the agent, <clears throat> excuse me, even as the lender is to create excitement. It's to add emotion, inject emotion into the deal. And then you hand it off to people like me. And that's why I'm wearing all black is for intimidation. Everybody, um, you hand it off to the appraiser and then the appraiser strips the whole deal of all the emotion because we have to because the market doesn't necessarily speak with emotion about things. They just give us data, numbers, and facts. So when it comes to the emotion of buying a house, am I going to overpay? Of course, that's what the appraiser is there for. The appraiser is there to be the objective, unbiased, uh, unemotional voice that says, well, let me tell you what the market says about what you're about to pay or what you're willing to pay. Now, in the current market, um, and, and the term overpay is a subjective one because there are many who are paying considerably over the list price today that we don't necessarily, we can't necessarily define that as overpaying. They might be overpaying on the list price, but in the general market of, of comparable sales, it, that price might be supported. And when they look at all the other buyers out there and all the other homes, they might say, looks like it's worth it to me. And anytime there is a willing buyer and willing seller especially willing buyers that are willing to dip into their pocket and bring out cash to pay more for something or cover the difference of something. That is what helps move markets forward is, is buyers saying, I don't need to finance 97% of this house, which is putting all the risk on the lender or the investor. And instead they're saying, I'll put 10, 20, 30% down and I'll cover, say if it doesn't appraise, I'll cover some percentage of that. That's buyers making their cash work in the market and they are creating new comparable sales. So I would say as in anything, buying a house, buying a car, uh, getting married, picking a partner, whatever it is, keep your emotions in check. Doesn't mean don't use any emotion, but of course, keep them in check relative to the decision you're making. As you pointed out earlier, buying a house is the single biggest decision, both financially and emotionally that most people will make in their lifetime. So it is important, I believe, to temper your emotions accordingly, given the, the weight and the gravity of the decision you're about to make. Awesome. Okay. So let's say that I am purchasing a house and there's an appraisal gap. Maybe we can talk about that a little bit. Sure. Um, and I'm, I'm fine with that. I got that cash in my pocket. I want this house. It's my dream house. I move into the house. So I'm already kind of below on my equity. What are, or I guess, what are some things that you would suggest other than emotions to be okay with that? Is it just that I'm in my dream house and I'm going to be here for five years and that's okay? Is it understanding how you're going to build wealth over time with that equity? Things like that. Yeah, great question. Um, and obviously there are some, some aspects of it that I, I can only chalk up to what you just said, the emotion, where some people go, I just want it, Blaine. I, I don't really care. I want it. We've always wanted to be in this neighborhood. We've been looking at this house or these houses, the street. We don't care. Uh, and there is nothing that can overcome that emotion. I mean, if the people want it they, and they're willing to pay for it, all I can tell them is, well, here's what the market says. And so again, when people are willing to, to pay over and above or pay cash for the difference or whatever, that's what makes markets move. Now, I do have to caveat this conversation with one house does not make a market. So one house where somebody says, I'll pay $100,000 over market value for that house because we've wanted it. We've always wanted it. That doesn't make the market. It speaks to the market. And I might use it as a comparable sale. But to go back to an earlier question um, from Michelle, when it comes to comparable sales, we analyze all of the comparable sales. And if we see one that we consider to be an outlier where somebody paid $100,000 over sale price, where everybody else is paying $20,000 typically over list price, sorry, uh, we will we'll look at that and we'll go, well, this was an outlier. We had a much more, tip, more than typically motivated buyer on this case, and it doesn't necessarily represent the whole market. We'll give it some weight and some value in the appraisal, but we won't give it all the weight. So when it comes to emotions, 
I would say the same thing if I were advising you on getting into the stock market. I would say do your research, know what the parameters are and the fundamentals of buying, making this particular decision. And then also understand that equity is not static, nor is there a straight line from point A, which is where you bought it, to point B, which is five years out. It sometimes looks like a slow heartbeat. Sometimes it goes up, but then sometimes it goes down. Because remember, we said it's like a three-legged stool. Interest rates, buyer demand, inventory, all those things affect market value, and market value is closely tied to your equity. So if you overpay, uh, meaning you pay above market value as, as what the appraisal says the house should be worth in this market, um, yes, you could be upside down on your mortgage right out of the gate, which in three months, six months, a year, two years, three years may not matter. It may not matter because if the market keeps going the way that it is, you, you'll be above water in no time. You'll have some positive equity. You just have to know and understand that there are no guarantees. The stock that you bought in, in this case, the stock is real estate, that stock could drop. So as any broker in the stock market will tell you, only invest the money that you're willing to lose and able to lose, uh, money that you don't have to make your house payment with. It's, it's kind of the same thing on a real estate transaction. Uh, be willing to, to invest or buy that house with the full knowledge and understanding that equity is not necessarily going to stay the same, nor will it always just increase. If inventory changes drastically tomorrow, Let's say the market changes drastically and 10,000 foreclosures hit the market <clears throat> tomorrow. Well, that's going to suck up a lot of that buyer demand and it's going to even out supply and demand. And what happens when supply and demand even out is the prices tend to stabilize. So right now, because there's such strong buyer demand and such low inventory, prices are going up, up, up because of the competitive uh, almost auction-like atmosphere. I'll take 210, I'll take 220, who's got 250? And it just keeps going up, up, up. Well, when, when inventory balances, so does uh, the demand typically. And so if that happens tomorrow, uh, or they crank interest rates way up, one of the three legs of the stool could change and equity then can change as a result. Now, if we end up stabilizing and then something happens and the market dips down, your equity also dips down because equity is always based on a particular date in the market. When you say, how much equity do I have? You know, if anybody out there um, updates their statement of personal net worth, say every month or every three months or six months or once a year, you're going to do this calculation where you list out on the left-hand side, everything that we own. And on the right-hand side, everything that we owe and whatever's at the bottom is your net worth. Here's what we owe. Uh, here's what we, um, our value is. Your house might be worth 150 today. It might be worth 175 in six months. But if the market changes, it might be worth 140. So your equity can change. So back to your original question, what should we do with those emotions? Temper them. Go into it with eyes wide open and fully understand that this is an investment decision that needs to be uh, weighed and calculated emotion with uh, return potential return. If the return doesn't matter to you, it's going to be your forever home, buy away. Right. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Matt has a good question. He said, are there any resources out there that would be good for homeowners to use to do their research aside from having an amazing realtor friend? Uh, Treadstone actually has a tool called HomeBot, which is great. And it goes out there and tells you market trends and things like that. If anyone has any questions about that, we can get into it more. But it's a really good tool. But I'm also curious to know if you know of any tools that people could use to kind of you know do that research themselves, or if any of our viewers have tools too. Yeah, great question. Um, and and I would first point people to a, a company like Treadstone and say, look, these they have awesome tools. Uh, technology has advanced extremely far. Um, I will bring up the dreaded Z word. Of course, people go to Zillow and they look there. Um, here's the caveat with with companies like Redfin or Zillow or uh, and any of these is they use proprietary algorithms to determine what they think a house is worth. And the, those proprietary algorithms, which nobody really knows, they keep them secret. One thing we know that they do is they are scraping assessing data and MLS data to try to determine what that house should sell for or should be worth. 
And that scraping of data goes on at um, intervals. So we've had people where they say, hey, I looked on Zillow in my house, it says 315 uh, seems reasonable to me. And then they look the next day and it says 285. And they go, what just happened? Well, the algorithm kicked in, it scraped data, it found a cheaper sale that was similar, it spit it into the algorithm and the, and the, the value changes. So you have to be very careful um, with tools, if you want to call it a tool like Zillow, uh, because those numbers can change. They can be really close on one day and they can be wildly off. I mean, there's the famous story of uh, Spencer, the, the, the own president, the founder, I believe, the CEO of, of Zillow, his own house was off something like 40% uh, his estimate, he couldn't sell it for what Zillow said it was worth. So well, that's uh, funny. be careful with those, those tools. Mm -hmm. um, I want to touch base a little bit on having your home and equity in it. And maybe you're not ready to sell and you want to take some cash out to do those things. Um, every scenario is different and your lender can help you go through those things. But I kind of just want to touch on some of them. Um, if you have equity in your home, because maybe you've done some upgrades and things like that, you can go ahead and refinance, get a lower interest rate, have your monthly payments be more comfortable, reach out to us to see what kind of things we can do for that. Get your appraisal, that's always great too, because then you can really see your return on that investment that you put in. Um, some other things that you can do is get a home equity line of credit, which is great, which can help you um, take that money if you want and put it into your house to build more equity. So you're investing in your future self investing in your future wealth and getting ready to maybe put that house on the market in a few years. I think that's a good path to take if you're ready to do so. Um, some of the other things that you can do um, is just maybe you want to help pay for college and you want to take that equity out against your home. Maybe you want to have a wedding that you're going to help pay for. These are all things that people use the equity in their home to do and I think that it's a great path to take because rates are so low it's a good route to take by using that equity that you built in your home to help with life and things that come up. So I just wanted to throw that out there. So it's not all, you know, it's, there's a lot of positives to the market. Yeah, things are going up, but that's also great for you. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and, you know, people always ask when I, when I give talks or classes, uh, Blaine, when do you see this ending? And I always have to be honest and say, well, if you asked me three years ago, I would have said tomorrow it's going to end, you know, but it just keeps going up and up and up. Um, it, we, we know that it can't last forever, but our, what our hope is, is not that it lasts forever. Our hope is that when it does start to change, it just stabilizes so that wherever your equity has grown to, it just stabilizes and it goes back to a normal 3% annual growth instead of 10% annual growth, which is unsustainable. I mean, if we continue at this rate, a $300,000 house today will be worth a million dollars in three years. And, uh, you know, th there are a bunch of factors that have to, to keep up with that, like income growth, wage growth, and those kinds of things. And they aren't growing at the same rate. Um, but we are very lucky, I will say, in West Michigan. We are insulated from a lot of stuff. There's a lot of growth in West Michigan. Uh, we've been insulated um, home price-wise for many, many years. So as people say are uh, coming in from Chicago, New York, California, Florida, and they're buying houses in West Michigan, they're seeing home prices that relative to where they just came from are extremely low for what they can buy. So a $350,000 house here was a $750,000 house where they came from. And they're like, what's wrong with this market? Well, nothing's wrong. It's just a secret that we've been trying to keep a secret for a long time. Um, but it is now, it's like the secret's out. West Michigan's an awesome place to live. And now the market is kind of snapping back here to what it's been like in many other markets. Thank you. I just want, there's a couple of questions here. Sure. I to see. Mm -hmm. By the way, I saw Jay asked, um, what makes a house a C5? Um, for those of you wondering what's, what, he, what he means, Jay is referring to, uh, on an appraisal, there are two letter categories, Q and C. Q stands for quality, C stands for condition. 
And the ratings go from one to six, with six being the worst, both in the quality category or lowest quality, and six being the worst condition in the C category. Uh, one being brand new in the condition category, one being highest quality in the quality mm. category. So what makes a C, uh, house C5? I would have to have the definitions in front of me, um, Jay, so I apologize. But typically, um, a C5 is still livable but in rough shape, meaning usually it says something along the lines of the definition of C5, something along the lines of um, extensive uh, updates and repairs needed to make the house more livable. It's still livable, although I think there are a lot of lenders that won't lend on C5. Uh, maybe uh, Brendan or, or Shana or somebody can, can confirm. Uh, but a C5 usually means the toilet's been ripped out. Uh, there's no refrigerator. There's s some things where somebody could say, well, I can still live there, um, but it's not what the normal market would accept for living conditions. Jay actually, he went on to say, uh, he had a seller who had a house on the market that he thought needed a few upgrades, but the appraiser listed the house is in C5 condition. So the conventional loan wouldn't work for it. Why would, how, okay, yeah. So it's it's typically where, where the house um, is close to being unlivable and a lot of uh, what we call deferred maintenance where the lender is looking at that and going, mm, we're kind of losing our support uh, on this case because they're looking for the house to be um, financially support the loan. And if that wood is decaying on the exterior and the kitchen's all tore up and there's, there's lots of deferred maintenance, in many cases, that's what would, would get a house rated as C5. And, and uh, by the way, normally what appraisers will do in a C5 situation, even if they don't do it on their own, the lender will ask us to comment in the appraisal, what would need to be done to bring the house up to C4 condition? So we call that a cost to cure. We will put in the report, uh, the house is missing this, this, and this, or we saw holes in the walls, or this is missing, and this, that, and the other. And if they do this, this, and this, we can bring it up to a C4 condition, you know, livable average condition, that type of thing. Hope that makes sense. Absolutely. Oh, yeah. Shauna says they're looking for a C4 or better. Yep. 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 Good question, Jay. And it is nice that you list in there like what the cost to cure items are because we as your lender can help you get that figured out because you do love the house and you're like, yep, I'm, I'm good with that. Let's move forward however we have to do that and we help you get that Yeah, and in, in most cases, uh, taking a C5 to a C4 is relatively minimal, um, meaning a couple things pushed it over and we just can't, it just doesn't meet the definition of C4. C4 basically means average. It's like you look around, you go, yeah, it's average. It's not new, but it's not horrible. It's average C4. C5 is, ooh, that's beyond average, above average wear and tear, missing cabinet doors, you know, so on and so forth. But with a few cosmetic updates and a few fixes of the missing wood flooring and holes in the walls, we can bring this thing up to C4. If it goes to C6, that usually means unlivable under all circumstances. And in many cases, the house needs to either be completely remodeled or torn down. That's C6, unlivable. And oftentimes it's because it's, it's health and safety. We're doing it for- yep. You got it. Your own, yep. You got it. Awesome. All right. I'm gonna go through my list of questions and see if I have anything else. But did you have any questions for me, Blaine? Um, yeah, I guess just, uh, you know, a lot of times it comes up, uh, the, the one of the big mysteries, you know, pulling back the curtain of the wizard is CU or collateral underwriter. Um, so if you can maybe help people understand once you get the appraisal and all the docs and everything from us, you guys send it through a system. You send it through that system prior to the appraisal and you get requirements and, and scores and things like that. But can you help people understand what collateral underwriter is and, and what risk scores are, say, once you put the appraisal through and those kinds of things? Sure. So when the appraisal comes in, like you said, it goes through a system and it's going to pull information from certain areas of that report. And we're kind of looking for the same things that you just mentioned. So is it livable? Are there any health and safety issues? Uh, what kind of comparables were used? Do we agree with those comparables? Things like that. And we want to make sure that the report that we're getting is a true reflection of everything and that something wasn't missed. The collateral underwriter focuses on the collateral. So you have your credit underwriter that's going to look at your credit character as an individual, meaning your credit score, income, assets, things like that. And your collateral underwriter is well-versed and focused right on the home that you're going to buy or refinance. 
Yeah. Kind of super. Yeah, super important to understand. You you just said it perfectly that uh, the 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 credit side of things is looking at the buyer, buyer borrower, and the collateral side of things is looking at the collateral. And we don't have anything to do with the credit side of things or the borrower side. We have everything to do with the collateral side. And quite often, I think um, agents, sometimes lenders too, will will kind of. Uh, paint the appraiser as uh, the, the one making or not making this deal happen. When in reality, appraisers are only reporters in the market. We only report what we see, what we analyze, and then we summarize in the report. Here's what the comparable sales say. And it doesn't mean we don't sometimes get it wrong or maybe pick different comparable sales than what somebody else uh, might pick. However, what is often misunderstood is that once it leaves our hands and goes to you guys, it is going through a computer system in a big database where they're comparing it. You guys are looking at it. You got underwriters looking at it. You got a computer algorithm looking at it. And they're comparing it against a variety of things. The Fannie and Freddie database of appraisals on maybe that house that's been appraised before, maybe all the comparable sales that have been appraised by or used by other appraisers in other appraisals. They look at all that stuff and they compare every bit of data that's in our appraisals. And one of the big ones I, I'm sure you see all the time is it gets flagged for something called overvaluation. Can you speak to that briefly? Uh, well, sometimes it will get flagged for overvaluation because they'll look at the comps and maybe they, it looks like the appraiser picked high price comps to kind of get you to where you needed to be. When in fact, there were more uh, realistic mm -hmm. comps that were nearby that were more the same home that they should have been using. Yes, it would have brought the home in at a lower value, but they went to try and find the higher one. And the reason that the lender does such a big uh, look at the appraisal is because we are here for the bar, the buyer. We want you to be in the best situation. We want you to be in the house, pay for what it's worth, and so on and so forth. So it's not like we're trying to make it more difficult. We're trying to watch out for you and have your back because this is a huge, like we said, it's a huge decision. It's a huge financial undertaking. Yeah, uh, well, well said. Um, and again, just so that everybody listening understands that it's not just the appraiser, it's the whole collateral system is looking at it, uh, not only to protect their system, they want to make sure the collateral is there to support the loan or back up the loan. They're trying to make sure that buyers aren't getting, for lack of a better term, screwed. They want to make sure that the buyers are protected. And believe it or not, appraisers are too. You know, our job, it says right in, in uh, USPAP and the, in the, the global job of the real estate appraisers to protect the public trust. That's the language. Meaning we are the objective unbiased third party that comes in and looks at it and goes, again, we strip all the emotion from it and we go, what does the market say? You need that voice in the market to protect the public trust. The buyer may not care. The seller certainly doesn't want to hear what we have to say. Even sometimes the lender and the agents don't hear, want to hear what we have to say. But the overall public trust, meaning before you buy, you may be concerned about what are these houses appraising for? Well, I see what they're selling for, but what is the real valuation? It's only when you're in the middle of a transaction that the, that rationality tends to go out the window. You just want what you want. The seller wants what they want. Agents and lender, they want what they want. And then the appraiser comes in and goes, well, Hey, here's what's going on in the market. And then it's up to everybody to decide what they want to do. Yeah. So it is but, about protecting the, the, the loan, the collateral and the public trust. Yep. I like that you say it's about trust and that's why it's so important to have a good lender and a good agent. That's also going to have your back Absolutely. Gonna make sure that you're making a good decision. That's the best one for you. And you know, they're on your side. So Choose your agents and choose your lenders as trusted advisors. And the great agents and the great lenders out there use that language. I'm your trusted advisor. I'm your agent for life. I'm your lender for life. Because they know one transaction does not make a relationship. The relationship and long longevity makes the relationship. And, and the lenders, you guys, for sure, it's why we've been doing business 20 plus years. Uh, and, and it's a lot of the great agents on this call. Um, it's that trusted advisor relationship that's super, super important. Absolutely. Absolutely. Right. Um, we have a couple more questions yeah. here. Yeah, see one from Navanas. I hope I said that right. I don't want to miss over that. For someone who's buying at a discount, how much does the sale price of that subject property affect its appraisal? If all other factors being equal, comparables are at 100000 but the subject property was bought for eighty. 
how much does the $80,000 figure set the level of what the appraisal might turn out to be? Okay. So if I understand your question, great question, by the way, here's what, and, and appraisers will somewhat differ on this. So you, you, you said a couple keywords in your question, which would make me um, steer differently on my answer. You said at a discount, which leads me to believe there is some mitigating factor, like they're buying it from a family member. It's a non-arm's length transaction, we call it. Maybe somebody's giving a gift of equity or something. Whatever is affecting that discount, we're going to take into consideration. And it is not uncommon in non-arm's length transactions. That means grandma's selling to grandson, mom selling to the daughter, whatever it is, there's some relationship. We look at those and it's not uncommon in those cases for the house to appraise more than, much more than what it's being sold for because it is being sold at a discount. So in that case, the market data is gonna speak loudly. The market data of similar homes or comparable sales is gonna say, this thing should be selling for a lot more. It should be selling in this case for 100,000, not 80,000. We're gonna see that, we're gonna put that in. If, if I don't know what caused the sale price to be 80, I'm gonna get on the, the phone and start calling listing agent and parties to the transaction and say, I see something odd here. Can you tell me how the sale price was derived? It's usually at that point, somebody's gonna say, oh yeah, it's a dad selling to a son. And we go, ah, makes complete sense. Now I know. So where we're not given that information, we'll seek it out. That's our job to find that out. So in that case, um, that, that's an easy one. Uh, now that house will end, that $80,000 house is going to end up as a comparable sale on the market. So an appraiser a week from now may see that in the neighborhood and go, all the other houses are selling for hundred. This one's sold for 80, but a good appraiser too will call on that and say, this one's out of whack. It's an outlier. What do I need to know about it? So that's usually how those types of scenarios play out in the market. Wherever, just like the hundred thousand over over list price sale I mentioned earlier, somebody's willing to pay a hundred thousand over list price. Um, that if it looks like an outlier in the grand scheme of things, if it is a comparable sale, I see that that house sold for six hundred thousand and all the comps are selling for five hundred thousand. I'm going to dig into that house and I'm going to find out that it was a more than typically motivated buyer who was willing to overpay. And although I might still use it as a comp, I'm going to explain it in the report, and I'm probably going to give it less weight in the final opinion of value because it was a more motivated buyer. Hope that makes sense. Good appraisers will always take into consideration the motivations and the particular scenarios of each comparable sale. And then we will also, when we derive our opinion of value, we will weight, W-E-I-G-H-T, like at, give weight to certain comps over other comps. We're going to look for the ones that are the most similar or sold under the most similar circumstances, and we'll give those the most weight, and we'll give the least amount of weight or less weight to sales that are outliers or some somewhat out of whack, like this example here. Hope that helps, Navanas. Yeah, that's great. Thank you so much. Blaine. Did I pronounce your name right? Yeah, yeah, you got it completely right. Perfect. Thanks for asking. Thanks, of course. Wonderful. Um, so we're coming up on almost an hour here. I know we've went over a lot of information. If you guys have any questions about equity and what Treadstone and your lender can do for you, definitely reach out to us. We're, like Blaine said, we're your lender for life. We have your back, your friend. We're going to make sure that you're in the best financial situation that we you can be in. Um, and then if, Blaine, if you want to help with any values or things like that, or reach out to your agent or a friend. A lot of people have friends that are agents. So... Absolutely. Yeah. I, I mean, we, we, everybody who knows us knows that we're happy to do pre-listing appraisals. And mm -hmm. uh, if you've got a cash buyer and they're, they're not getting an appraisal, you can always call us. We're happy to do an appraisal for them. Um, also, I always recommend to agents, um, although the lender might not like me saying this, but if you're getting an appraisal waiver, you know, a lot of times it'll come in and the appraisal is waived, but I think good lenders like Treadstone will still recommend. They'll still say, Hey, it's totally up to you. If you want to get one, um, understand that getting an appraisal waiver is not confirmation of the value or the sale price that they are uh, uh, paying. An appraisal waiver from the lender is only saying that the uh, risk is being mitigated. Fanny looks at it and goes, yeah, we're okay. We, we get it. There's an appraisal already in the system. This house sold last year, whatever. They're okay with it, but they are not confirming the value. So you still could be overpaying. And we have seen people run into this where they get an appraisal waiver on their sale. A year or two later, they try to refinance or sell. 
they find out that they're way upside down on their loan and they go, I got a waiver as if that's equivalent to an appraisal. It is not. Um, it is just Fannie or Freddie saying we're okay with the risk in this deal. So um, again, tread lightly, uh, just know what you're getting into, know what, know what you're doing as agents, of course, know what you're advising. Um, I always recommend, I mean, the, an appraisal is four or $500. It's the cheapest thing that people are going to pay for on their, their closing statement, um, yet add maybe one of the best insurance policies for at least knowing what that place is worth when they bought it. So you can always reach out to us. We look at deals all the time, by the way. We look at appraisals all the time. People, you know, agents will call up and say, hey, just had this one come in and we're not happy with it. Could you take a look at it? Yeah, we, we do that as a service. We consider ourselves strategic partners with all of you. So happy to help uh, lend understanding and, and answers to things whenever you need it. Wonderful, you explained that perfectly. Spot on. Thank you. Yeah, well, thank you, Blaine, for joining thank us you. today and everybody for getting on. Um, thank you for all your great questions. Again, if you have any questions uh, about equity and things like that, reach out to Treadstone or your trusted lender. If you have any questions about pre-listing appraisals, reach out to Blaine and his company too. Um, the, this is being recorded and we'll have some links out there for you as well. So if you guys wanna rewatch or reach out to us individually, the information will be out there too. Awesome, yeah, and if, you, if any of you are not in our Facebook group, uh, jump into that Facebook group because we answer these questions all the time. Treadstone is in there. And uh, I know a ton of you agents are, but if you're not, just jump on. It's called Appraisers Helping West Michigan Real Estate Agents, something like that. Um, and we answer this stuff all the time and it's completely free. So we want to be a resource for you. So thanks everybody for being on. Absolutely. Really appreciate it. Brittany, thanks for the opportunity. OD and, and everybody from Treadstone. Thanks, gang. Thank you. All right. Have a good afternoon, everybody. Take care.